you know how sometimes you get into it a little bit with some neighbor ladies on Facebook or next door about some issue at your kid's high school or some local election, and then slowly it dawns on you that you're the target of a stealth attack by a cult-like women's group run by a member of the famous billionaire family who owns the Chicago Cubs? Yeah, I didn't either. Until... All righty, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to The Long Con, the podcast that takes an informative and lighthearted look at the dismantling of representative democracy and the collapse of Western civilization. I am Paul Trainer, your host, and I'm so glad to be back with you. Uh, we've had a bit of a pause between episodes, as I, like everyone else, have had to scramble to adjust to life under a pandemic. We also took some extra time with this episode because it is extremely important. I wanted to make sure to get it right, so I've spent almost a month on it. And also, full disclosure, we want to avoid being sued by right-wing billionaires. So, a special welcome to Attorneys for the Ricketts family, who I imagine are listening for the first time. So, obviously, right now, everything in this country is about systemic racism, looking at it, reevaluating it, considering our places in it. And that's really at the core of what the long con is about because we explore how systemic racism is both uh, used as the tool, but also as the Achilles heel for the free market fundamentalist movement. And that certainly is the case with our episode today. So today I'm going to tell you about this women's group that an old friend of mine helped start right here in our community of Wilmette and how it's grown into a massive recruitment tool to draw women into the right-wing libertarian movement. But Lest you think this is only a local story, let me assure you it is not. This is a national story and an important one because the policy circle, the women's group at the center of this episode, is franchising across the country as we speak. In a few short years, it has expanded from being a single circle of women in my community to an organization with 325 discussion circles spanning 40 U.S. states and four different countries which is awfully impressive growth for a nonprofit, isn't it? And in a weird, indirect way, I was uh, kind of a witness to its founding. So what is the policy circle? Well, I'll let them explain it in their own words. Olivia launched Legs of Tao, a new yoga studio concept. Ready for that handstand, Scorpion? Simone is a doctor helping seniors rehab after surgery. Can you give me one more step? Janet is a stay-at-home mother of two kids and a part-time website designer. What river did Washington cross, kids? Women pursuing their dreams, but with real challenging concerns. All these new regulations make it really hard for me to grow my business. These new rules make it expensive for my patients and leave me less time to care for them. I'm worried about my kids' future. I want real information so I can understand the issues. I just want to talk without getting into arguments. I feel like I'm all alone, powerless to do anything. They wish they could connect with other women who feel the same way. The Policy Circle is starting conversations across the country. We're providing policy briefs with facts to foster thought-provoking discussion. Why don't we call other women who want to understand how policies affect our lives and get together? I think my neighbor feels the same way. I'll call her. Hi, Charlotte. What's going? It's been way too long since we I last I was thinking spoke. maybe we could get together. It's kind of like a book club, but on policy. Wow, that sounds great. I didn't know you were interested in this. I thought I was the only one. It is so great to have you all here. You will emerge more knowledgeable about a wide range of issues because, seriously, Every issue is a woman's issue. You will gain the confidence to make an impact in your community, and you'll realize that you're not alone. We're starting a conversation to change the conversation. Click here to start a conversation. So that's the audio from a very well-produced animated introductory video on the Policy Circle website, which gives you the basics. Women coming together to discuss policy issues in a warm social environment that's kind of like a book club for policy issues. And the women they target run the gamut from very busy professionals and female entrepreneurs burdened by onerous government regulations to stay-at-home moms who feel isolated, completely alone, and scared for their children's future. 
kind of a, a weird emotional appeal there, right? But still, sounds pretty innocuous, right? I mean, the video says they discuss policy issues, but uh, does it have a political component to it? Okay, well, here's another short clip, this one uh, from their website also, but featuring testimonials from actual members. When I was learning about the policy circle and talking to Sylvia about it, I realized that there was a big gap with women my age who want to be educated about policy and about politics and don't know where to go to get those facts. I was immediately really excited to share that with my friends. It is such a new concept and an exciting idea for women to be able to be educated and empowered in a way that they haven't been before. It was exciting to have women in a room talking about um, politics in a very non-partisan way, um, educating ourselves on something new that we've never talked about uh, in a social situation. I really enjoyed getting involved in the policy circle. I've met some amazing women. Uh, we've had some terrific bipartisan discussions on some very complex and weighty issues. Now, in this second snippet, we hear from a young professional woman saying it's a great resource for women who want to become educated about public policy or politics, but don't know where to go to get those facts. So this is the first we hear about politics. But in the very next segment, we hear from an older homemaker about how exciting it is for women to educate themselves on public policy issues in a nonpartisan way. She even tells us how great the bipartisan discussions have been in her circle. So, based on what this video and the website uh, tells us, politics are not the focus. And when they come up, it's bipartisan or nonpartisan, at the very least. And the policy circle isn't limited to women's homes or social circles. Not anymore. It started to flourish in corporate America as well. Here's a senior finance guy from J.P. Morgan talking about policy circles. And the video Chiron below him labels him as a quote unquote, policy circle connector. I know that most of the women that I've introduced to this are extremely busy. They're busy with career and family. And I've, I've been amazed to see that notwithstanding how busy they all are, they're very excited about allocating some of their precious time to the circles and to finding other people to join them in the circles and to doing the pre-work, if you will, to come prepared. I just... I just think that's great. And that, to me, is uh, evidence that there's a lot of value in it. Because if it weren't valuable, people wouldn't make it a priority. People are always asking, well, what do you do? What is your follow through from the policy circle meetings? And it's actually just the conversation we have. Because after that conversation, we go out into the community and start talking to our friends, our colleagues, our clients, other professionals and we bring up some of the topics we've discussed in the policy circle. And all of a sudden, someone else is interested in joining and someone else wants to join the conversation. That woman you just heard is a VP at J.P. Morgan. And while she talks, the video shows women having a policy circle meeting in a corporate meeting room. This VP says that, you know, as women discover it, more and more want to be involved, which does make it seem like a great and maybe even important networking opportunity for the women who work there at J.P. Morgan. So good thing it's completely nonpartisan, right? Because it seems to me like there's a bit of social pressure or peer pressure or maybe work pressure to join a circle. Or if not, you know, pressure exactly, there is a strong suggestion, uh, almost explicit, that women will realize some social or professional gain from getting involved. Well, luckily for all of us, the Policy Circle is not a professional or a political organization. Oh, no. It's a charity, a 501c3 charitable organization, specifically, which means it is the exact same tax status as a church. So legally, it cannot engage in any political activity, nonpartisan or otherwise, uh, but because they conduct nonpartisan fact-based policy discussions, the Policy Circle's very wealthy donors can get a nice tax break and, again, remain anonymous as well. So, a nonprofit, nonpartisan women's group, that's like a book club for policy issues, where they meet in social or professional environments to have fact-based discussions about the issues of the day. Sounds perfectly reasonable and hardly worthy of a long and dedicated podcast, right? Well, after several years of research and some rather intense and heated interactions with various members and associated entities of the group, I see it 
just a little bit differently. Policy Circle is actually an astroturf group that uses false pretenses to lure busy, lonely, and or socially ambitious women and recruits them to serve a much larger anti-government, inherently racist, free market libertarian agenda. Or rather, uh, let me clarify, I should say that it is simply my opinion that the policy circle is actually an astroturf group that uses false pretenses to lure busy, lonely, and or socially ambitious women and recruits them to serve a much larger anti-government, inherently racist, free market, libertarian agenda. So, counselors, <laughs> I know you're listening. So I clarified that as merely my opinion. Okay, we good. Which I will now uh, attempt to back up with a shit ton of direct and circumstantial evidence to use the legal parlance. So the woman behind the policy circle is Sylvie Legere, and she uses her maiden name professionally. She's a French Canadian, but in our community where she's just another billionaire mom, one of two, I believe, including her sister-in-law, she's known as uh, Sylvie Ricketts. And oh yeah, she doesn't mention it in the policy circle land, but her husband, Todd Ricketts, is currently the RNC finance chair, which means he's the official chief fundraiser for Donald Trump's re-election campaign. And Todd's one of four billionaire siblings who just happen to own the Chicago Cubs. And Sylvie's brother-in-law, Pete Ricketts, is the governor of Nebraska, who actually uh, just got called out by a group of black civic and church leaders uh, for calling them you people in a tense meeting about why there'd be no charges brought against a white bar owner who shot and killed uh, a young black protester in Omaha during the George Floyd protests. But I want to uh, clarify that there is no explicit evidence that I have of Pete Ricketts being a racist. The explicit evidence I have is of being a racist is of Pete and Todd's father, uh, TD Ameritrade founder, Papa Joe Ricketts, as I like to call him. You can just call him Joe or Papa. Um, but he's a racist, or at least, let me clarify, he's someone who likes to send and receive racist emails with his friends and family. He was outed uh, a year or so ago, I guess, uh, by a group called Splinter News. You can read all those emails online. Uh, They're wildly entertaining and horrible. And um, you can also see that uh, the Cubs had to release uh, at least a couple um, press statements denouncing them. But I digress. <laughs> they sound like a lovely family, right? Um, actually, I hear <laughs> Delora is, is very cool, and Tom, who runs the Cubs, is fine. He's probably too busy to be overly political, but who knows? So wait, okay, what does racism have to do with the policy circle? Well, in many ways, the policy circle was the catalyst for this entire long con project. And in our first episode of the podcast, we explored the fake controversy that broke out over a racial civil rights day at New Trier High School on Chicago's genteel and leafy North Shore, where three of my own Lily White children um, are currently students. And that is a crazy story in and of itself, with major national implications about union busting, systemic racism, and the attack on public education. Plus, it really illustrates the tricks of the trade of classic con artistry, so uh, you should check that out if you haven't uh, already, but you don't have to hear that to enjoy this. So basically, I'm just a local dad. I'm an actor and I'm a media producer. And initially, I was only posting on Facebook in support of Seminar Day. And I was talking smack about these outside political operatives ginning up a fake controversy that we talked about in episode one. So I started posting about them on Facebook. And then suddenly, I got a phone call from a local reporter for the Chicago Tribune, an excellent beat reporter named Jonah Meadows, asking me for my comment on being foyad. And I said, my common on being, what now? And he told me that I was just one person that had been named in a dozen Freedom of Information Act requests or FOIAs, which had been sent to Nutria Township in the span of just a few weeks. And they were all demanding information about Seminar Day. And one of them, sent by a lawyer who I've never heard of, um, asked for any contracts or financial agreements that I and my company, Hey Moon Media, had with uh, the Nutria School District, which was none, by the way. He was just fishing, um, but that's how I went from simply observing this racist con being run by outside groups on our community to being sucked into the story itself. Because the people sending out these FOIA requests all seem to have one thing in common, which was the policy circle. And when I checked out the policy circle's Facebook page, I actually found an article they'd written and posted to Facebook called, <laughs> I shit you not, how to file FOIA requests. Okay, so a few of the FOIAs were sent out by Betsy Hart, 
which made total sense. Betsy's the one with a decades-long career at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, she was what I call the inside woman on the Seminar Day Con. Uh, another was sent by Jasmina Hauser. She's the Betsy's uh, Breitbart sidekick. And they created their own little fake group called Parents of Nutrier. They were being egged on by a big mouth, conservative talk radio personality named Dan Proft. So how did I know? Something else was at work? Well, because there was also a FOIA request from a woman named Beth Feely, sent a few days before the FOIA uh, that was sent about me. And this was uh, my aha moment, if you will, because I know Beth pretty well, at least I did back then. Um, Beth and I went to the same church, and our families um, were part of the same tight-knit Bible study small group for like years, like six or seven years. Now, within our small group, Beth and I were frequently the ones who would disagree about a particular gospel passage or interpretation. Uh, Beth was very conservative, and I'm very progressive, and it was obvious, and everybody knew it, and we were all cool with it, you know? Um, like, for instance, Beth is the type of Christian who frequently talks uh, about the gay agenda, using that exact term, uh, and I'm the kind of Christian who thinks that that's some bigoted bullshit, but we were still tight, actually, truly. I mean, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin... So anyway, I thought, um, if Beth is involved with whoever's sending these FOIAs, which definitely seem coordinated, why wouldn't she have reached out to me directly to ask me, uh, to, or at least to give me a heads up if she wanted this info? So I called her, and I got her voicemail, and I left her message, and she never, ever, ever called me back ever again. I also called her husband, who I knew quite well, been close to for years, same thing, left a message, never heard back. So if you've ever been part of a church small group, um, you know that these are actually pretty tight bonds, right? I mean, we weren't like all besties that hung out all the time, but I mean, we got our families together at least once a month for like years and, and are all supposedly accountable to each other and to Jesus because that's kind of the whole point of um, a Christian small group Bible study. So it was really weird and it was uh, hurtful, um, but then it made perfect sense to me. Because Beth had been a stay-at-home mom the entire time that we'd known her, but recently she'd gone back to work part-time. She'd told my wife excitedly, in fact, that she was working for her neighbor, Sylvie, who'd started a new women's discussion group called the Rose Friedman Society that talked about policy but wasn't political. Beth assured her anyone would enjoy it because they didn't talk about hot-button social issues at all. No gay rights or abortion, mainly just good old economic policy. I don't think Beth ever went so far as to actually invite my wife, uh, but she assured her that it wasn't political, and we were legit excited for Beth, honestly, because she was so excited. But the last time that I'd seen her, she and her husband invited my wife and me over to their house for dinner, just the four of us, and this was right after the RNC convention in 2016, and Trump was the newly minted nominee. And Beth had been there. I found out she'd gone as, I think, an alternative delegate for Illinois. And she was very excited about it, and I could tell that her head was turned. Um, and I was really curious as to how she'd react to Trump getting the nod, because, of course, as a good, good Christian woman, I knew she thought he was vile, because he is. And I'm pretty sure she was a staunch Ted Cruz woman, big on family values. I would uh, bet heavily on that one. So in case it seems weird to you that suddenly I'm here dishing on my friend and sister in Christ like this... Um, I'd like to just say that it does feel weird to me too, but um, unfortunately, part of this story is how Beth became a public figure and how she's actively involved in some pretty big efforts now to deny systemic racism at the national level and like big efforts at the national level. So actually, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute uh, to this interview. Uh, this is much more recent. Sylvie Legere did this interview just a month or so ago during the pandemic and the lockdown, and it's uh, from a podcast called The Sit Down with Evan Baer. Well, we turn to a solution now, a solution uh, many months, I think years in the making, actually, as Sylvie Legere is a, I would describe her as a ideological entrepreneur, as someone who saw a challenge with how people are getting confident in and exploring their understanding of conservative and free market and American ideas, really. Uh, Sylvie, glad to have you with us. Love to learn a little bit about uh, the Policy Circle, this innovative platform that you guys have built. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, having me. And it's great to hear uh, James O'Keefe say we need people to think. Uh, that's actually the premise on which we uh, build the policy circle. It's um, about four years ago, uh, so I started the policy circle to really um, inform and inspire and develop civic leaders. Inform, inspire, and develop civic leaders. So, 
Now Sylvia is talking about developing civic leaders and not just having conversations, and she's doing so from an explicitly conservative, libertarian, free market perspective. And I should note that Sylvia appears in this episode right after the host finished talking to James O'Keefe, whom you might remember from his fake sting videos on Project Acorn and Planned Parenthood. Uh, Sylvie shares the major growth that's been happening at the policy circle in recent times. And then Evan asks her a really interesting follow-up question. And now we have about um, 325 circles in uh, 40 states and in four countries. So, um, and, and our model is not really organizing things for people. We recruit circle leaders mm. to bring together a small group of women who engage in these discussions. And then from there, they decide to uh, further uh, engage in their communities. Well, amazing uh, success so far, these 300 circles, 40 states, multiple countries. I'm sure there are a ton of examples of ways that this has shaped people's lives. Uh, does one come to mind about someone who came to a circle and, and engaged in this platform uh, that helps us understand the power of what you've built? Uh, yeah, you know, in um, in uh, one circle here uh, in Illinois, you know, a circle members, what happens, I'd like to just backtrack, what happens when you take the time to engage in a conversation with a group is you start to realize people have, you, you share similar values and ideas and priorities. So you find allies to engage in a cause. So we have a circle here, who, um, a circle member who with other women that she met in a circle decided to really take on and challenge some of the programming in the, in the high school that was really politically divisive hmm. as well as kind of propelled this victimhood mentality and decided to really challenge that. And today they're actually in ongoing conversations with the school board to, to modify that. She's also uh, involved in uh, working with people, you probably, your network knows, uh, Bob Whitson in launching uh, the new site 1776 Unites. She mm. was instrumental in, in launching that. And that all came about from her initial engagement with the policy circle. Same with people being tapped to... Um, be on board and commissions at the state levels. Uh, so it's, it becomes a springboard. We don't tell people, we don't direct people on what to do. It really becomes a springboard for them to find a confidence, to engage the connections to a broader network and organizations to, um, to then um, really fulfill their, their life's potential and be truly impactful as a, a, civic, uh, a civic leader. Okay. <laughs> Lots of stuff packed into that little segment, uh, much of it around how the policy circle is an effective recruiting tool for new civic leaders and how it's been a springboard, to use Sylvie's term, for women being tapped to serve on boards and commissions at the state level. In fact, she tells Evan it's similar to your network, as she explains the policy circle model is actually to recruit circle leaders who will then bring together small groups of women. So why aren't they just honest about their ideological underpinnings, you might ask? Uh, because believe me, this is about as transparent as the policy circle ever gets. I mean, everything else they do, including these casual policy discussions that women gather together to have, is top secret. I mean, it. I mean, not only are their activities hidden from the public on an incredibly sophisticated web platform they've developed, but the policy circle literally requires all members to sign an extensive and rigid non-disclosure agreement which prohibits them from discussing what happens in any policy circle with any outside person or entity. All right, wait, did that just sound completely insane? Yes, it's completely fucking insane. So it's a framework. It's, uh, it's a tool to connect with, with people. And also we are seeing policy circles started in enterprise. So this is a way for uh, companies, for, for, for you, for your audience's uh, leaders to mentor emerging leaders, to connect with people and to really help people see this intersection of leadership and public policy. The materials that you all equip these uh leaders, some already established and some emerging, when they get the materials, when they're having those conversations in a safe and friendly environment, it gives people confidence to be able to articulate the points and to go out. And whether they're at their bridge club or in the boardroom or on a walk with neighbors, they have the confidence and the real understanding to take that out into the world. And that's such a critical component of bringing these ideas out and persuading others. 
Yeah, I'm going to try to get them to wear cameras uh, for James O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a part of being brave. And sometimes you need to connect with others and exchange, you know, and that's very much a value of the network that you've put together, right? But in each of our communities, um, it, it's good to find allies and uh, and build that confidence with other people around you within your business or in your community. So thank you. Well, I think we just brokered our first live on-air partnership, Policy Circle and Project Veritas, unofficially. Oh, wow. See, that's the breaking news. You heard it here first, folks. Sylvie Legere jokes about having her groups wear hidden cameras for self-described muckraker James O'Keefe and Project Veritas, his group with a $10 million uh, budget that's funded by conservative billionaires and operating as, you guessed it, a tax-exempt 501c3 charity. But that's not even the part that interests me. This is. So I'm going to play a few seconds again. So we have a circle here, who, um, a circle member who, with other women at She Met in a Circle, decided to really take on and challenge some of the programming in the in the high school that was really politically divisive, hmm. as well as kind of pro- propel this victimhood mentality. She's also uh, involved in uh, working with people you probably, your network knows, uh, Bob Whitson in launching uh, the new site 1776 Unites. She was mm-hmm. instrumental in, in launching that. And that all came about from her initial engagement with the policy circle. Okay, so I bet you can guess which circle that was. It was Sylvie's circle, which met in Sylvie's living room in Sylvie's mansion in East Wilmette. And the woman that she's talking about here, of course, is my old Bible study bud, Beth Feely. And the group of women she got together to take on the local high school because of a politically divisive uh, programming that propelled a victimhood mentality, that was the parents of Nutria Betsy Hart and Jasmina Hauser who ginned up the fake controversy around racial civil rights uh, on the seminar day at my kid's high school. And by the way, um, if you watch my documentary about all this, Tip of the Spear, you listen to the first episode, you'll know they called me a conspiracy theorist and a kook for trying to draw any connection between the Seminar Day protests and the policy circle and what happened after. But now here we have Sylvie not only admitting it just a month or two ago, uh, but actually holding it up as a shining example of the policy circle in action and what it can bring to the women who join. So Sylvie mentions that Beth uh, recently co-founded the 1776 Unites Project with prominent black conservative Bob Woodson at his foundation. Why do you have to point out he's black, Paul? Well, it's relevant, and this is a big deal, because this is a formal response slash rebuttal to the New York Times 1619 Project, which is all about the role of systemic racism in the founding and flourishing of America. And like the Seminar Day protests, 1776 Unites seeks to undermine and reject the notion of systemic racism as an ongoing problem in this country. In other words, it's just more racist bullshit. Uh, But they do use black scholars and black faces to spread it. But let me just say this, okay? So this is crystal clear to all y'all. I don't know, and I don't care what's in Sylvie's heart or in Beth's heart. When I call them racist... It has nothing to do with their personal prejudices or their lack thereof. It means that they intentionally prop up the system that benefits from systemic racism while denying its existence. And that's what I mean anytime on this show I call a group or a person or a policy racist. And I hope you can see that clear distinction because we have to be able to look past it and get to that reality. Okay. Before we move on, um, I just want to share that Evan Baer, uh, the host of this podcast, is the chairman of another 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization called Tenio, where he passionately works to advance the ideas of modern conservatism, to quote their website. So both he and Sylvie are just casually chatting about how each of their groups promotes free market conservative politics, which is a clear violation of their tax-exempt status. And you know what? Groups like this do it all the time. And they usually do it with a chuckle because they know it's all a big con. They are both part of this insanely extensive and interconnected network of 501c3 nonpartisan charities that actually work to recruit folks to the right-wing cause. Instead of paying their rightful share of taxes, wealthy elites can divert that money to these fake charities, take the write-off, and then use these groups to advocate for policies to further cut their taxes. And if anyone tells you both sides do it, they don't really know what both sides are doing, okay? Do progressive groups abuse tax-exempt status? Sure, they do, I'm sure. 
Do people run scams where they can cash in based on that? Yes, undoubtedly. But there is no comparison. Let me tell you again, no comparison between that and what happens with these billionaire oligarchs of the radical right. Because they don't support charities. They invest in charities. And they expect it all back in windfalls from tax cuts and regulations. It is absolutely asymmetric warfare. And it has changed the national conversation and swung all of our politics way to the right. And not to get too off track, too late, uh, but I'll link to the Tenio network site in the um, episode comments, and it is worth a quick aside. Because if you look at Tenio's about page, they have endorsements from conservatives like Hugh Hewitt, who calls it uh, the Olympic Village of conservative groups, and Prager U founder uh, Dennis Prager, who says he doesn't know how conservatives can win the country back without Tenio. Uh, whatever that means. And there's a blurb from an exec at Americans for Prosperity, the Koch Brothers 501c, and a blurb from the founder of A Girl's Guide to Guns, and a blurb from a major defense contractor who's part of the network. And Tenio is funded by a really large group of conservative donors, including billionaire Betsy DeVos for one. And a really odd thing that I actually just discovered putting this episode together is that Evan's podcast, The Sit Room, is listed all over the internet. If you Google The Sit Room with Evan Baer, B-A-E-H-R, you'll find it. Uh, But you can't actually find a working link to it on its own. The only episodes that I found were on a handful of conservative websites like the Cato Institute. But otherwise, this show is like a phantom. And Cato, of course, is one of the most prominent right-wing think tanks, along with the Heritage Foundation, both... 501c3 charities, by the way. So I found Sylvie's interview with Evan on the policy circles in the press page, and I downloaded it like right away. And here's where I know I'll start sounding really crazy. (laughs) Start sounding crazy, I'm sure you're thinking. Um, Because I wrote about what I discovered on this podcast about Beth Feely and 1776 Unites on my Long Con Facebook page. And then when I went back a couple of days later, um, the blurb to this, um, this podcast is, is still there, but the audio link is now dead. And it has been dead for a week now. I've checked it. And I know that sounds like crazy paranoia, um, except that the Policy Circle has scrubbed its website in response to my public comments before. In fact, I asked my friend, uh, Leslie Wyrick, what she remembered about them scrubbing docs from the internet during the Seminar Day controversy. So what we saw at first was um, posts on there saying, hey, please run for office, join our other friends from our group on these boards. Um, There was a call out for, hey, we need people to run for the park district. So it was really clear that they were recruiting candidates and a 501c3 is not supposed to do any kind of uh, candidate recruitment, lobbying, nothing political. They're tax exempt. Donations are tax deductible. I think that's what's frustrating because I don't um, take away from any of the discussion around, you know, current events or views or any of that. I think that's all really good stuff and it's part of our democracy and I think that's great. I just don't think there's been total, full disclosure about the ultimate goal. I, I really believe that the ultimate goal is to defund public education Um, reduce community municipality services, get free market candidates elected. And I don't think that's been um, really clear. So Leslie works with 501c3 Charity. She's very active with our public schools, and she's also quite involved with local politics. So she had a, a really interesting vantage point that really helped me sort through all of these crazy shenanigans um, I'm about to share when the policy circle started mobilizing stealth attacks on our school boards and our municipal government. We'll hear more from Leslie in the second half of our policy circle saga But this idea of the policy circle marketing itself in a certain way, but having an entirely separate agenda, is really the whole point of this episode, because it's really the heart of the long con. So before we get into that, we should meet the other two co-founders of the group. Uh, The policy circle was Sylvie's brainchild, uh, but it was when she met two other women down in Indianapolis, which is my hometown, Naptown, holla! Uh, that the poly- my kids are going to be like, it, not that my kids would ever listen to this podcast, but if they did, their eyes are rolling right out their heads right now. Anyway, um, she was down in India, and that's where the policy circle really took form as a national organization and began to franchise outside of Wilmette. 
So uh, here's a bit of audio from the Policy Circle Founders video. And you'll hear from all three women. Sylvie Legere, she's the first speaker with the French accent, of course. And then my fellow Hoosiers, Angela Brawley and Kathy Hubbard. The Policy Circle is about conversation. And conversation are like seeds that we plant. And they grow, they multiply, they change the landscape. Everything starts with a conversation. And that's what the Policy Circle is about. Four years ago, Sylvie, Kathy, and I said, we, we need to do something to get women more engaged in the public policy dialogue. We were all together, the three of us, at a public policy forum. We noticed that there were very few women in the room. We thought, that's strange. You know, there have got to be a lot more women like, like us who really care about public policy issues. So they met at a public policy forum in Indy in 2014. There were very few women in the room, and they thought, that's strange. But was it? I mean, this was, as far as I know, an American Enterprise Institute conference. And if you've not heard of AEI, uh, they really are probably the dominant right-wing think tank in America, probably more so even than Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute. So the lack of women in this room is, is not really a bug, <laughs> but a feature. Um, because I'm guessing there weren't many people of color there either. Because AEI, like most libertarian conservative think tanks, is basically a group funded by rich white men to advance their own personal and corporate interests. I'm just going to tell you what I think. And like other right-wing think tanks, AEI advocates for lower taxes on businesses and the wealthy, fewer protections for consumers and the environment, privatization of public assets, and a complete dismantling of the social safety net. You know, all those things that are important to the freedom-loving common man. So these extremely rich gals were there at a discussion of public policy, but were allegedly surprised by the lack of women in that room. Now, of our three Policy Circle founders, um, the most successful by far is Angela Brawley. Um, Angela was the former chairwoman of the board. She was the president and CEO of Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, which became WellPoint or vice versa, which is one of America's biggest insurance providers. Um, and she's said to have resigned under pressure uh, after Blue Cross continued to jack up health insurance premiums. Um, I can tell you that mine have gone up insanely in the last few years. But uh, she left with a $20 million severance package, and Angela today serves on the board of a number of Fortune companies. So Angela's doing okay. But in terms of the policy circle triumvirate, she is definitely the poor relation. Uh, but what Angela lacks in hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, uh, she makes up for, more than makes up for, in street cred. So Sylvie Legere, of course, is a self-described entrepreneur who made her first billion by marrying Todd Ricketts and is on track for her second bill whenever Papa Joe Ricketts kicks the bucket. Kathy Hubbard, the third leg of the stool, is uh, married to Alan B. Hubbard, who chairs a venture capital firm in Indy. He's very prominent down in my hometown, and he made his fortune as the owner of uh, several chemical companies, among other things. And Alan's net worth, I couldn't really tell. He might only be worth a few hundred mil, um, I'm guessing. I couldn't find his actual net worth worth. But in this vast policy combine where millionaire operatives uh, advance and protect the interests of billionaire donors, uh, I would say that Al is uh, squarely in the middle, the foot in each camp. So Sylvia and Kathy's husbands, Al and Todd, have another surprising thing in common. Um, both men were actually tapped to work in Donald Trump's cabinet at the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017 as the election, or as the uh, rather Trump administration came in. Uh, but both men had to withdraw their nominations because neither of them could get approval to serve from the OGE, which is the government ethics office, because of their vast financial holdings, uh, and it featured too many conflicts of interest, and they couldn't clean them up enough to um, get through uh, government ethics. So uh, Trump had picked Todd Ricketts to be the deputy commerce secretary, and Al Hubbard was going to be the next um, deputy education secretary under our old billionaire buddy, uh, Betsy DeVos. But the OGE nixed both of them. So just let that sink in for a minute. These guys had such extensive and questionable financial ties that they weren't deemed ethical enough to serve in the Trump administration. And it's a shame 
as Al Hubbard was a perfect fit for the Department of Education because just like Betsy DeVos, he spent a ton of his own money ruining the public school system in his home state and advocating tirelessly for failing charter schools that have looted the public treasury and resegregated the inner city in Indianapolis, which is a whole other story. I know this personally, though, because my own alma mater, Broad Ripple High School, Ripple Rockets, um, was closed permanently in 2018 after being starved of funds and stripped of pretty much all of its remaining white students. And we're going to talk about that and, and a larger attack on public education in, in an upcoming episode. It is quite the con and quite the lucrative con. But Al Hubbard was also director of the National Economic Council under George W. Bush, and he was the deputy chief of staff to Hoosier VP Dan Potato Quayle in the George H. W. Bush administration. And while he was there, Al was the director of something called the Council on Competitiveness. This secret council started uh, during the Reagan administration under Reagan. Bush started it. Quayle took it over. And it was designed to let big campaign donors meet secretly with the vice president's team to ask for relief from government regulations that they didn't like. And this included serial polluters like oil and chemical companies. So you can probably guess where this is going. In fact, there is a fascinating and comprehensive congressional report on the Council of Competitiveness that I found in a book form. I'll link to that with the episode. And this is an actual excerpt from the congressional report. Quote, Mr. Quayle and the person who was then the director of the Council on Competitiveness, Alan Hubbard, who has since resigned in an ethics controversy, went around the country meeting with top GOP campaign contributors saying, what regulations are you having trouble with? What regulations would you like us to target? And that is how the list of regulations for activity by the Council on Competitiveness is made, end quote. In fact, Al Hubbard worked hard to gut the Clean Air Act in secret, even while one of his companies was contributing to the acid rain problems we had back in the day. Business thrives, people die. Oh, I think I just coined a phrase. Hmm, catchy, huh? Anyway, I share that not to point out uh, just that Mr. Hubbard has been found to lack the ethics to serve in multiple administrations, but to reinforce the central contention of the long con, which is that this libertarian free market Trojan elephant, which cannibalized the GOP from within, uh, started during the Reagan administration, continues to this day, and continues to mask its true agenda with disinformation campaigns funded by the ultra-wealthy and carried out by charitable organizations like the Policy Circle and the American Enterprise Institute. And now I will gently remove and set down my tinfoil hat um, on the soapbox next to me. So incidentally, um, the Policy Circle, not huge money, but you know, for you and I, it's, it, it's some, uh, some nice change. Um, the Policy Circle spent uh, over two million bucks so far to get up and running. And although the donors that are getting the tax breaks do remain anonymous, um, I have every reason, of course, to believe that Sylvia is self-funding it. Uh, maybe Kathy and Angela are chucking in a few shekels. I don't know. Um, certainly they could. Most of their money is spent on developing this sophisticated, super-secret circle member web platform that I mentioned, that Evan Baer congratulated her on. And then a huge chunk is uh, spent developing their policy briefs with leading think tanks, like the ones we talked about. I want to quickly mention one other group. I think this is the only org I cite in this episode that is not a 501c3 charity. This one is a political super PAC called Ending Spending, Inc. And this PAC as you might have guessed, is against government spending. And if you haven't heard of it, it's funded by Papa Joe Ricketts and was run by Sylvie's husband, Todd, for a time. Now, during that time, Ending Spending had a strategic consultant named Kristen Jackson, who made 126000 bucks from them uh, in Ending Spending, I think in 2016. Uh, but I discovered her LinkedIn page where it says that Kristen was not only the policy director for Ending Spending, Inc., but also the policy director for the policy circle, even though it didn't look like she was on the policy circle's payroll from what I could glean from their uh, 990s, which is a bit limited. Anyway, I don't know if that's illegal, unethical, or just plain irrelevant, but I thought it was an interesting detail uh, because I think it speaks yet again to the actual quote-unquote nonpartisan agenda of the policy circle, which is different from how they position themselves. But listen, if you think I'm overstating the AEI connection to these three ladies, um, in 2017, so this is the year the policy circle members came after me when Trump was the uh, newly minted president, um, AEI's National Council of Ambassadors included from the state of Illinois, Sylvie Legere and Todd Ricketts, and from the state of Indiana, Kathy and Al Hubbard. 
And uh, the AEI, I should point out, has an annual budget of around uh, $50 million and is a 501c3 nonpartisan charity. Okay, so is the Policy Circle really a billionaire-funded astroturf group designed to recruit unsuspecting women into the free market libertarian cause? Well, let's hear another word from its founders. We believe that women have in themselves a really strong capacity for top leadership in public policy. Uh, they can advocate for policies that foster human creativity and responsibility in a free market economy. You know, when we started the policy circle, we said we're going to help women find their voice. But you know what we learned? Women have a mind of their own. They know their voices. They found their voices. They just need to practice their voice so they have the confidence to go out in the community and make their voice heard. We believe that women all share um, some core values, which are freedom, the importance of the free market system, and the free enterprise system, uh, and many other topics. In fact, the individual policy circle leaders and their, and their own members can actually determine what topic we're going to discuss. But we provide the scholarly briefings and research that they use as a basis for their discussion. Right, so this one like kills me, really. It reveals the cynicism of this movement because you hear uh, Sylvie says, women are thought leaders. Uh, women have a mind of their own, says Angela. And then Kathy says, we believe that women all share some core values, which are freedom, the importance of the free market system and the free market enterprise system and many others. Okay, Kathy, that's just one core value. Um, girlfriend, uh, freedom, importance of the free market the free enter uh, enterprise system, that's all just one thing. And anywhere that you hear talk of liberty or freedom from a think tank or a 501c3 nonpartisan charity, you will find underneath it discussions of slashing regulations and environmental protections and removing penalties for businesses that cheat and lie, leaving consumers in the dark with no recourse. I will say that is almost guaranteed as you look at these groups. So, yeah, in fairness, Kathy does say, and many others, um, but clearly it is the free market economics that are keeping the women up at night. Um, and then the biggie, uh, Kathy says, that circles can pick their topics, but we provide the scholarly research and briefings that they use as a basis for discussion. And as Hamlet would say, aye, there's the rub. So the policy circle creates and curates policy briefings. This is essential knowledge here. Policy briefings on every subject they discuss. The learning, they call it, in one particularly creepy passage I found. And women are required to read these policy briefs and then come prepared to discuss them as the nonpartisan, fact-based content of their circles. And while they do occasionally toss in a few source documents or nuggets from center or maybe even center-left news outlets when it fits their agenda, the overwhelming majority of policy brief content comes directly from libertarian think tanks. Like, for instance the American Enterprise Institute, and Cato, and the Heritage Foundation, or climate change denying groups like the Heartland Institute here in Illinois, or from various state-based think tanks that are part of the highly structured and conservative state policy network. Every one of them is a 501c3 charity. All of them are serving up allegedly nonpartisan content that is extremely and exclusively right-wing. In fact, if you want to dive straight into the black heart of the long con, just Google State Policy Network, and ALEC, A-L-E-C, all caps, and see what you find. State Policy Network, SPN, is the uh, spine of this national movement, so we'll talk about that um, some other time. So, am I crazy and paranoid, or is there really a billionaire long con? Well, I would submit that the two are not mutually exclusive, but um, one of the most striking things that I've discovered is just how many meetings donor summits, and networking events happen within this libertarian billionaire network. I mean, there, there are hundreds each year, if not thousands, and there is tremendous overlap at all of them, not only in terms of donors, but also in the paid operatives that work for and contract with these groups. So you talk about a free market. I mean, in this circle, just about anybody with a sharp mind, a big mouth, and a libertarian economic agenda can get themselves funded and hit the circuit. And one such operative is a woman named Heather Higgins, an extremely sharp woman who started an organization called the Independent Women's Forum, which in many ways is a precursor to the policy circle. And this is Heather offering a surprisingly frank and candid pitch 
to a room full of donors and operatives at the David Horowitz Freedom Foundation recorded in 2016 during the Trump election. Women. Women are now, would anyone like to guess what percentage of the electorate women are? 55. I'd heard 54, but if it's 55, thank you, you've made my case even better. Uh, women also vote at a higher rate than men do. So for the men in the audience who think that the last thing they want to do is support a women's group, understand that if you have any interest in running elect winning elections, you have to think of this as a market segmentation issue, and you can't leave out that part of the market if you want to win. So we have worked hard to create a branded organization that is, does not carry partisan baggage. Um, it's called Independent Women's Voice. Uh, being branded as neutral, but actually having the people who know know that you're actually conservative puts us in a unique position. Our value here and what is needed in the Republican conservative arsenal is a group that can talk to those cohorts that wouldn't otherwise listen, but can do it in a way that is taking a conservative message and packaging it in a way that is, uh, will be acceptable and will get a hearing. There you go. The value is in donors knowing how conservative you are, but packaging that in a way that seems nonpartisan. Is it really that cynical? No, it's worse. I was working in 2012 on trying to move women who were soft Obama approvers into being Obama disapproving. And I wanted to make an ad that they would like and if, that they would think was speaking to them from somebody who understood them and that they would then share with their friends. And we, in fact, I was talking about this with Rich and he said, oh, you mean the women that I'm dating? I've dated tons of women like this. Obviously, this means that all of us ought to go find Rich better dates. Um, but Not only is she positioning herself as someone who can manipulate progressive or moderate women into voting for conservatives, but she demonstrates with her little joke at the end there that she has utter contempt for the women she's appealing to. Heather Higgins' group is called Independent Women, and she's telling a room full of rich old white dudes to fund her so she can trick women into voting for conservative males. But like Sylvie says, women have a mind of their own. In fact, you know what? I'm going to post a picture of Beth and Sylvie and several other Policy Circle gals in uh, their Mind of My Own t-shirts. They all have matching t-shirts that say Mind of My Own, and they were at a state policy network conference where they were wearing these shirts, where they were going to get information disseminated and network and connect with people like Dan Proft and this uh, large um, information machine run by white males. So truly boggles the mind. And the truly terrifying thing here is that of these big conferences and donor summits, like anything that the Koch brothers uh, or SPN runs for that, in, for that matter, um, they are top secret. They're usually closed to the press, and even the billionaires that attend them have to hand over their phones and cameras to even get into the room. Secrecy is a hallmark of these groups. So this is one of the rare such chats that's actually available for public viewing. So just imagine what they're saying when there aren't cameras. Now, it probably goes without saying that Independent Women's Forum and the David Horowitz Freedom Foundation, where they were speaking, are both 501c3 charities. Another fun fact Independent Women's Forum was founded in 1992 and was originally called Women for Judge Clarence Thomas. They came together to support his nomination during the Anita Hill hearings. And like most of these groups, Independent Women's Forum has a, both a 501c3 and a 501c4 arm, which is called Independent Women's Voice. Now, 501c4 orgs can fund candidates, they can do political lobbying, and they can hide donors, which is great, but they're not tax exempt. So it's just important to make that distinction because most groups um, fund their 501c4s on a more limited basis for their overt uh, political activities, but then they keep the bulk of the nonpartisan quote unquote work in the tax-free 501c3. And uh, the same people usually run both. So as such, um, independent women have endorsed such champions for women as 2012 Missouri Senate candidate Todd, if it's legitimate rape, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down, Aiken, and uh, Indiana, our own Hoosier Senate candidate Richard Murdoch, who said that when a woman is raped, she carries a gift from God, and that such a pregnancy, quote, is something that God intended to happen, end quote. 
Mm, not my Jesus. So IWF supported uh, Murdoch after he made that statement, by the way. Just putting it out there. Uh, they are against Title IX. They are against the Violence Against Women Act. They've tried to get lessons on global warming eradicated from public school science classes. Um, that last one isn't sexist. It's just horrible and dishonest. And it kills people while lining the pockets of fossil fuel billionaires. But still, I mean, you get the idea, right? In fact, Independent Women's Forum is so dishonest that they actually publish uh, annual reports, or at least they've published several of them, called Working for Women, A Modern Agenda for Improving Women's Lives, in which they package and sell anti-feminist policies against gender equality, equal pay, maternity leave, etc., and spin them as if they were pro-women. And in 2016, the election year, they also published one called Working for Young Women, in which they had a long list of project supporters, all of them women who worked for a who's who of libertarian think tanks and groups, plus Sylvie Legere and Kathy Hubbard from the Policy Circle. So we'll post these, and I strongly encourage you to check them out for yourselves, because they're just horrible. All right, so I hope the takeaway for you here is not just that this is one vast, super well-funded network that the Policy Circle is part of, it is that, but really that this is more like a single organism with independent-looking shoots that pop up and flower all over the place, but they're really all part of a single underground root system. Now, for much of our history in America, it has been the Democrats who have upheld the structures of systemic racism and uh, kind of property supremacy, economic eugenics, as Nancy McLean called it. And it's been the Republicans who fought against it with their founding, with the Civil War, for instance. But starting with the rise of economists like Milton Friedman, this concept of neoliberal free market economic theory, which was considered crackpot by mainstream Republicans, by the way, for the first 20 years, and by everybody else for that matter, has hijacked the once grand old party. Uh, it's subverted the values of traditional conservatism, and it exists to benefit the very, very few at the expense of the many. And this is not by accident. But this radical form of capitalism, whatever you call it, meaning unregulated capitalism with no protections for anyone but the very wealthy, has caused, perpetuated, and defended systemic racism in America from its founding. And not just systemic racism, but sexism as well. The policy circle is merely the newest example of people being tricked to vote against their own interests and to support policies that are damaging to them. But until people see just how intentional this deception is and how much money, thought, and organization are going into this con, the running this long con, we are all in danger. Today, right now, representative democracy is in danger. And I never thought I would say that in my lifetime, and I'm almost 50. Okay, I think I've thrown enough at you for uh, one episode. You're probably ready to uh, take a break, have a lie down, maybe a nap, or a quick cry. But you know what? There is still so much more to discuss about the Policy Circle. So our next episode will uh, pick up where this left off, and it will be a lot more fun, I promise, because we're going to uh, have a bunch of guest appearances in that one, and we're going to reveal a long con that was so outrageous, so cynical, and so downright sneaky that you're not going to believe it. And we'll talk about how I accidentally made a documentary feature called Tip of the Spear, and then how shadowy forces tried to stop me from showing it. And by exposing that con, we will show you how to recognize it when it comes to your own community. And believe me, it's a coming. And then uh, hopefully we can also show you what you might be able to do to stop it. So thank you so much for joining us for part one of our look at the policy circle. We hope you'll come right back and start the next one. In the meantime, you can reach out to us at uh, info at the longconpod.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can tweet at us at at the long con pod or you can like us on facebook check out our youtube channel we've got all kinds of stuff on longconpod.com which is our website and um yeah we're going to make a dedicated page for policy circle stuff so if you're uh, in media or you're a journalist or you're just a concerned citizen that wants to uh, verify the things i've told you uh, check that out it will be up uh, very soon so thank you so much uh, we'll talk to you soon and um yeah stay safe and healthy everybody <laughs>